Thank you, Steve. Um, we'll jump right into it. So Izzy Tapuchi, you are the president and chairman of Israel Bonds here in the United States. Uh, it, it'll work. You basically sell Israel's economy through bonds. How strong is Israel's economy in your opinion? The Israeli economy is extremely strong. I just came back from um, Israel a week ago. We took a delegation over there, and I see that uh, Minister Katz isn't he around here. But when you drive up to Jerusalem, you can see exactly what's going on. There's very few places today in the world that you can see that kind of development. If you go and stand in a tall building in Tel Aviv, you will see more cranes than anywhere else in the world. And if you look a little bit at the Israel... And if you look a little bit at the Israeli economy of the last 20 years, we have grown by 180%. I'm not so sure that there are many countries that have reached that kind of a growth. Yes, true. It's all relative. And I think since 2008, you don't talk any longer about a growth of GDP of, you know, 4 or 5%. You're talking of the normal today, which is more like 2 or 3%. And Israel is leading one of the best economies that you've got in the world. So, obviously, if you look at the fact that we are today selling half a billion more in Israel bonds here in the United States alone, from 600 million to 1.1 billion, we have definitely managed to get the message across that it's an enormous investment, it's a good investment, and there's no reason to look anywhere else but to invest in the Israeli economy. Neely, that's also something, a job that you are tasked with here in New York, specifically with trying to garner interest to get increased investments, uh, particularly when it comes to the tech sector in Israel. What's it like now? Do you feel that BDS is at all having an impact? Do you feel that there is a decline, that the startup bubble might be exploding? Uh, not at all, not at all. I agree completely with Easy that Israeli economy, if you're looking at the macro indicators, is doing very well. Of course, there are challenges and we won't go into it, but uh, if you look at the macro, Israel is doing well. Uh, uh, growth rate of OECD countries, low unemployment, low debt, and in regards to, so, so that's uh, one area. In regards to U.S.-Israel relations and uh, BDS, as I see it, doesn't play a role in, in the economic relationship between Israel and the U.S. I think that we spoke in this conference or the people here spoke about the strategic relationship between Israel and the U.S. from a political perspective. I think there is no doubt that this relationship is crucial to Israel, to both sides, also from an economic perspective. We see, we speak a lot about China, India, and, uh, and, and, and Minister Bennett at the time when we hosted him spoke about this is the new future for Israeli high tech. I can tell you as the economic representative here in New York that we see hundreds if not thousands of companies coming to the U.S., especially in the high tech sector. The relationship between the countries is strong, is important, as, and is crucial for both sides. Luckily, with the support of uh, the U.S. public, politicians, and, and government, we don't see, I don't see any influence of uh, BDS on this relationship. Uh, I want to go to Keith Elliott for a moment. Keith, you are Senior Vice President of Noble Energy. Thank you for being here. Today, the Israeli government passed new language of this uh, stability clause, which I don't want to bore our audience too much about the technical side of things, but that's basically supposed to pave the way for us to finally get that gas out of the water, right, or get it out of the ground. Uh, and that's going to be your job, is to help us get that out of the ground. But what are the, when you, how do you envision this program? How do you envision the further development of Leviathan or of this whole big new gas project? Well, thank you, Jacob. And First of all, let me say it's a tremendous pleasure to be here with, uh, with you this afternoon and for the invitation from the Post. And I would say also for Noble Energy, it's been a tremendous pleasure to be partnering in Israel for the last 17 years developing the energy industry. And I think today's, um, today's announcement and the passage of the, um, of the action in the, in the cabinet is another step in the journey. It positions uh, Israel at the crossroads of a very unique opportunity 
to build on what's already been realized. If you look back over the past, it's only been a short time, three years since Tamar has been on production. Uh, Tamar is now producing over 50% of Israel's electric power. More importantly, what Tamar has done is taken the soot and ash away from the power plants at Redding and other parts of the country, cleaner air, creating a healthier environment. Um, since its onset, Tamar has brought over 5 billion shekels to the uh, Israeli uh, government uh, to fund the programs that the government deems essential. Where Israel stands now is at a point to greatly magnify that with the next wave of major development. <clears throat> and so we look forward to being part of that and bringing those assets uh, onto production so that the nation continues to realize the economic benefit, not only for itself, but for its neighbors in the region. So, I, thank you, Keith. Professor Chalamish, I'll ask you the tough question that I don't know that Keith, because he's got to be diplomatic, might not want to answer. But what we learned from the natural gas story recently with Israel and the back and forth and the, what happened inside the Israeli government, so we see that Noble is sticking by Israel. But do you think there might be repercussions wider that other companies that thought to come see this regulatory stuff that's going on and say, you know what, not for me? Sure. So, first of all, I would like to thank you and the Jerusalem Post for putting together such a wonderful conference and uh, inviting me here this afternoon. I think, Yaakov, you really raised a very important and critical question here because Nobel Energy is truly um, a great example how a foreign company, in this case, U.S. Uh, energy company, is willing to uh, be patient and, and, and struggle and go through all these regulatory and economic challenges in order to eventually, as we just heard from my colleague uh, Keith, to, to get it done and to uh, move forward with the energy industry. But as we all know, not all companies have the privilege of doing it. If you are a public company, sometimes you cannot wait necessarily four, five, and six years. If we learn anything from the last couple of years is that uh, although energy tends to attract disputes between foreign investors and governments, there is something unique about the story of Nobel Energy and the Israeli government because it truly involved all the aspects of, of, of a drama. Um, but we want to move forward. We want to take the energy sector to the next level. Uh, people often talk about the startup nation and how to take the startup nation to the next level and build uh, great companies and big companies. I think the energy industry is an example for uh, an industry where you can create bigger companies, you can employ more people, it's a diverse pool of workforce, you can have very high skilled workers, less skilled workers, you can bring to the industry um, uh, people from the Orthodox community, from the Arab community, and most importantly We've been talking all day about the geostrategy and the geostrategic status of the state of Israel. I think energy is a critical part of this story. It's not only about making money and creating jobs. It's really about improving the geostrategic status of the state of Israel. And finally, may I say, Yaakov, um, people kind of wondered what the Israeli regulators learn about the energy story and the crisis with Nobel Energy. I think that many, regular, many people would like to see regulators uh, more proactive, but in a different way. Uh, regulators who work with the industry and think about ways to take the industry uh, to the next level. Well, let, let me just add crisis that's now behind us moving forward from here. But uh, Izzy, I just want to I want to go back to you on, on that issue of uh, so you you sell Israel bonds. We've sold now over a billion dollars. I think three years running, which is a tremendous success in of itself. But. I think maybe I'm wrong, and, but when I was a kid looking back right here in the United States, you bought an Israel bond as a gift, as a bar mitzvah, or you know, a kid was born, but it was also a way of kind of giving charity almost to the state of Israel. It seems that that's no longer the case. There's actual a belief that this is a sound economic investment. How have we made that shift? Thanks. Just a couple of comments. First of all, thanks very much for having me here in Jeru on the Jerusalem Post conference. It's a real terrific conference. And number two, uh, whilst I do feel pity for Noble with all of the ups and downs that they've had, just imagine if you would have had to deal with the Canadian-American pipeline. <laughs> you probably prefer to be in the Middle East in the, with, our, with our 
um, with our uh, fines there. And now, basically, the way we changed this is this. We did a couple of things. One, we ensured that we changed the narrative to an economic narrative. And we stressed the strengths of the Israeli economy, as I mentioned before. It's a very strong economy. And there's no doubt, the minute you offer people the possibility of a good investment, there's no reason why they shouldn't invest it. That's number one. Number two, we became much more proactive. Instead of having the fidelities of this world grabbing your money, we said you come to us. And we made sure that we called you a month before the bond was due and told you that we had very good rates and why not invest in Israel bonds. And number three, we went online. And today, every morning, I walk into my office, and there's at least 70, 80, over the weekend, 100 trades that are being done automatically. Now, that is all based on the strengths of the Israeli economy. And we have pushed very hard for ensuring that we compare the Israeli economy with other economies around the world. I happen to come from Australia. It's true, you could have got on a 10-year Australian government bond 5.8%, which was double what you got by the Israeli bond. But the risk of a devaluation is so much greater there. And the minute China had a smaller hiccup, the Australian dollar dropped from parity to 70 cents to the dollar. So you would have lost your pants and a few other things in an investment like that. Whereas if you stuck to the Israeli bond, you would have made a nice little profit with it. Mm -hmm. Keith, one of the big issues that people talk about when uh, making the argument of why we need to, Israel needs to focus and invest and make these partnerships when it comes to the natural gas is that this will have regional implica implications, wide and be far beyond just the Mediterranean coast off the state of Israel. What are those implications? How do you envision, what, what is Noble's pitch on that? Well, I think clearly we see that the region as a whole if we look at it from just a pure supply and demand perspective, is fundamentally short gas in nations that I think Israel has a strategic interest in uh, relationships with. We heard in the earlier panel discussion about a strategic interest in a relationship with Jordan. Uh, part of what we're doing as a first uh, bit of development of Leviathan is consummating a contract to supply gas to Jordan from Leviathan through Israel's domestic infrastructure. So I think that's one example of a situation where Israel has an opportunity to take advantage not only of the gas for its own internal uses, for its own internal benefits, but for, more, for a broader geopolitical benefit. But so Professor Chalamish, just following up on that, the when, if you look at the region and these implications of Israel now having being a major gas power and being able to supply other countries, so Turkey is spoken about is maybe this is a way to mend fences with Turkey, or, and Jordan, as Keith mentioned, could this change the Middle East to some extent? Like through gas, we'll suddenly see this new realignment? Sure. So a couple of things. First of all, while Nobel Energy and the Israeli government have been talking in the last couple of years, the world has changed. I'm sure you all follow what happened to the price of oil. Uh, from my perspective, the impact of U.S. shale story on oil markets worldwide, it's the same story happening now with LNG uh, and natural gas worldwide. If you follow the price of, of natural gas, it's not what it was when Nobel Energy first entered the market and discovered these great discoveries. And when the geostrategy around you is changing, when you have, as we just heard earlier today, you have uh, new allies, you have new enemies, the price of the product, natural gas is changing dramatically, you ask yourself how you can take it as an opportunity and not necessarily as a threat. And I think a couple of things to keep in mind. First of all, I think the Israeli uh, market should connect with the great US LNG story. Uh, Israeli companies should work, should work more with great companies like Nobel Energy. Nobody said that Nobel Energy should be the only serious American company in the market. I think that people should learn from the Nobel Energy story and bring more energy companies to the Israeli market, including LNG-oriented, and we've seen a couple of attempts to do so. Another thing, and you, you uh, Yaakov, referred to that, is the new uh, strategy in the region, what kind of consumers we can see. 
And I think looking back in the last couple of years, Israel was very smart, the Israeli government, to use, to leverage the natural gas uh, discoveries for military, for diplomatic purposes. We all follow in the media, including this paper, the, uh, what's going on with the relationship with Turkey. Um, as has been reported in the media that there are MOUs with other countries in the region. So I think at the end of the day, if the uh, gas eventually be sold, we will see many of our old allies and new allies, as we learn today, uh, buying this great natural gas. And as we've seen with places like Russia and Eastern Europe and United States and the Americas, um, it's very important to use the commodity as a constructive tool to build new relationships and obviously to be profitable in the region. Neely, your job is to get people to invest in Israel, right? It's to go around, especially here in New York, we all know that in Manhattan there's a lot of money floating around and it's to get that money focused in, in the Israeli economy. So it, it's kind of a double question. Number one is, did the regulatory issue at all impact when you were going around trying to pitch the Israeli economy? Did you have people who said, you know, what happened here with Noble or now it's behind us, but what happened in the past is, is a deterrent? And two, what type of incentives are there? Like, what's the, how, how do we get people to say, look, it's worth it, not just because you get more money for what you invest, but here's an incentive that you as the Israeli government can offer. So, I'll start with the last one. Um, I think the main incentive in Israel, and I'm not talking tax-wise, and I'm not talking grants, the main incentive in Israel is the high quality of manpower in Israel. So I think today, and I've, I, I met some people in the crowd that I also has been in touch with, today a multinational company, a high-tech company that innovates and invests, uh, develops products, can't allow itself not to have a hub in Israel. Israel is one of probably the four uh, worldwide hubs of innovation and, uh, and the company knows that if they want to stay in the cutting edge and they want to develop technologies, they would probably use Israeli technology and Israeli ingenuity, engineers, etc. So this is the, the, the first incentive. What we as a government want to do is we want to try and attract companies that are not only high tech, uh, and that also do advanced manufacturing and others in order to try and expand the high-tech sector and not only to the 10% of elite or high-educated uh, uh, manpower in Israel, but also to try and get more of the Israeli society involved in, in, this, uh, in the economy or in the high-tech economy, and we are trying to attract additional companies, not only high-tech companies. For that, we have tax, exen ex uh, exten um, tax incentives and we have grants and others, but I think when companies are looking at Israel, they're mainly looking at the quality of, of, of the manpower. Um, I think in the energy sector, it was a new uh, we were the land of milk and honey, and milk and honey and gas, and it was a new sector for Israel. There were world changes, the prices of oil changed, there was a social unrest in Israel, and there were a lot of discussions on, uh, um, on, on cost of living, and I think this all also contributed to the length uh, lengthy negotiations and, uh, and, and uh, with, with Noble Energy and others. I think that uh, today we're a little bit in a different situation and hopefully this will not deter other companies in this sector and others to come to Israel. In other areas, the regulation, um, I don't see it as a barrier. Of course, the government has to do much, much more in order to ease business making and business uh, activity in Israel and also the easiness of opening uh, businesses and attracting foreign investors. But again, we see it in the U.S. especially, uh, people that want to tap into Israeli innovation invest in Israel and companies who want to develop new products have a hub in Israel. More than 300 multinationals, as we know. So. Is he, uh one of the, uh, you know, I've read that people say you shouldn't buy Israel bonds, that's as if you're funding the Israeli government, you're funding the occupation, so-called occupation of the territories, it's a, uh, you're funding the Israeli military machine. Is, do you ever encounter any BDS in that sense of people who are trying to stop the growth of that sector? Look, there is a little bit of it, but I would say, generally speaking, that uh, you don't feel it. And the reason for it is that I think that we've got a very good counter-argument, basically by telling people that if you want to ensure 
that when there is a call for divestment, you invest in Israel bonds, I think you're taking a very positive step in the right direction. And so consequently, I think that the BDS has got a very negative effect. And as was mentioned here before, there's certain universities, I think there was uh, uh, Ronald Lauder that mentioned that certain universities should be blacklisted altogether. But the ones that you ought to be investing in, and some people do in effect donate to various universities, the way you should be doing it is to buy an Israel bond, a 10-year Israel bond, and give it to the university. So then following year, so the following year when they have the annual general meeting and the BDS uh, organization turn up there and ask them, do you have any Israel bonds? What are they going to say? Do you really see any university tearing up a $1 million Israel bonds investment? So whoever you know that does invest or donate to universities, tell them do not give them cash direct, buy an Israel bonds, you help the Israeli economy, and you help the state of Israel, and you teach them a good lesson to the BDS guys. Okay. It's like instead of endowing a, a chair at a university, you endow an Israel bond of at a course. university. There's right? no reason why not. Um, Pr Professor Chalamish, one of the big changes that we've seen in recent years when it comes to the Israeli economy is this huge turn eastwards, right? The, the fact that I think largely has to do with what we've seen in Europe is the change and the diplomatic change, but also the sense that Israel needs to diversify its economy. It can't rely just on traditional markets, the United States and Western Europe. And you've seen this huge turn to the east, to China, to India and elsewhere. How does that manifest itself? What's the potential that exists there right now? Sure. Um, I think that one of the biggest challenges right now for U.S.-Israel economic relations is how to maintain this wonderful, working, productive relationship in an environment where Israel significantly invests in building very close relationship with China. The Israeli government signed a strategic agreement with the Chinese government uh, three years ago. And this agreement talks about uh, investing in tourism, technology, research, cross-border trade, investment. I truly believe that you can improve the commercial relations with China, but at the same time maintain the unique edge in U.S.-Israel economic relations. How can you do that? You focus on things which are unique to the U.S.-Israel economic relations. The proposed $40 billion um, aid, which will eventually be invested in defense, space, intelligence, cyber, that's one way to go. Another thing is to invest in uh, industries like energy, which can bring the two markets uh, together. Um, one of the consequences of the new Israel-Chinese relations is that you can see more and more Chinese uh, missions to Israel. You hear Chinese on the street in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. Chinese investors invest in record numbers in Israeli private equity and venture capital funds. And I think it's, it's critical because of two reasons. One is, uh, I'm sure you all follow the fact that this past uh, quarter in the U.S. stock market and uh, Silicon Valley, um, the, there was a serious decline in valuation of many promising uh, technology companies. So people kind of wonder what's the uh, future of this business model and the impact on the Israeli market. The good news is that so far, the impact on the Israeli market is very uh, limited. Uh, the uh, investments in Israeli technologies uh, are very strong. But moving forward, I think we have to follow very carefully what's going to happen in the Silicon Valley if some of these unicorn stories uh, will change and how, as I said before, this triangular US, China, Israel, how it's going to shape up. Finally, uh, I think it's important to understand that we live in a very global fluid world where you can have projects where you have Asian researchers from China, India, etc., working with Israeli universities, but the financing comes from uh, very prominent American venture capital funds, private equity funds. So these are not necessarily exclusive relationships. You can have parallel relationships at the same time. Neely, uh, something Professor Khamish mentioned cyber. Cyber today, I read recently, is we, is we in Israel, Israeli companies are exporting more cyber technology than uh, defense technology. So we're in, the, in seven billion plus dollars a year in cyber, and that could be civilian related or military related. Is that something that you're finding like a keen interest here in the United States when it comes to what Israel has to offer? Uh, without a doubt, Israeli cyber 
ecosystem is uh, about, I think, between two, 200 companies, something like that, and uh, attracts a quarter of the world's venture capital is attracted to the Israeli, invested in Israeli companies. We have uh, numerous companies that opened uh, uh, facilities here and activities here, open companies here in Massachusetts, in New York, in the Silicon Valley. Uh, we have a lot of interest from financial institutions and others in Israeli cyber technology. Uh, end of uh, June 28, 29, we host here uh, more than 20 Israeli cyber companies for one-on-one -on -one meetings with potential clients and investors. We have it regularly, all the time. It's no doubt this is one of the hot uh, topics now worldwide, and uh, especially in these uh, in U.S.-Israel relations. Can you give us an example of a recent deal that might have been closed on that issue? Um, so I mean, it's not that recent, but uh, Oauto, a small Israeli startup, was acquired by uh, by Microsoft. Um, um, additional CyberArk, based in Massachusetts and in Israel, has uh, grown. Dramatically, um, um, I'm probably missing uh, some others, but uh, EMC um, is um, um, acquired 13 Israeli companies, ma many of them in cybersecurity, very active, the RSA, very active in Israel in, in this uh, field, and, and many, many others. So. Keith, I have to ask you, your company has stood by Israel despite everything that's kind of happened. And I'm sure that there are people who have come to you and said, you know, Keith, it's not worth it. You should walk away. We saw what happened with an Australian company that did something like that. What do you answer them? What's the, what's the reason you've stuck by? Well, I think the reason that we've stuck by Israel and the reason that we've stuck with these projects is because we genuinely see the potential of these hydrocarbon resources, gas, to bring benefit to the nation of Israel and the region. I think it's important. A lot of companies have what they will call a purpose statement, and we're no different. Um, but we intend to live by ours, and we do live by ours, and our purpose is energizing the world and bettering people's lives. And when we look at where we have an opportunity to do that, Israel is one of the places that stands out. When we look at what we do in terms of improving quality of life, quality of environment, when we look at what we do in terms of bringing affordable, secure, reliable energy to a nation and to its neighbors, when we look at what we do to develop the society, to develop the capabilities, our biggest single area of social investment in the country is in education. We believe in developing the next generation. And we believe that what we're doing is aimed at supporting the development of that next generation in Israel and, in, and with its neighbors. And so um, that's something worth doing. It isn't something that's easy to do. Um, there are certainly other parts of the world where it is easier. Uh, if you look at our industry today, uh, in the last, uh, as, as Effie mentioned, you know, we've gone through some very traumatic times in terms of just commodity price. If you look at the last... Uh, 18 months have been over $350 billion worth of capital projects either canceled or uh, delayed, and yet we've continued to try to move forward. That's because that we believe that these are projects that are worth doing. 85% of our workforce is Israeli in Israel. This is their home, this is their company, and this is what we're about. Right. So we have one minute left. Izzy, this September you're finishing up your term here as the president and chairman of Israel Bonds. So tell us in just one minute, first of all, congratulations, and in one minute, what's the big takeaway from it? I think the takeaway is to run a setup like Israel Bonds as a business that I enjoyed very much, but having the pleasure of not giving it to shareholders, but to give it to the state of Israel. Okay. Thank you all very much. Thank, Thank you, you, Yaakov. Thank you. Thank you for a very interesting panel. We still have important speeches by Ambassador Ron Dermer and Carolyn Glick, and a special surprise. But for now, we're going to have an entertainment break. Please get ready to sing along with the iconic Israeli singer and songwriter, David Broza.
afternoon, Erev Tov. After this um, long morning and afternoon, I'm happy to be playing some music and hopefully you can uh, relax your minds a little bit. Um, I can't compete with all the ideas and the opinions that were expressed on this stage, so I would like to um, give you a poem by one of Israel's finest poets, Nathan Alterman. And while you're sitting here, the afternoon lingers, and um, this will be portraying a Tel Aviv beach in the afternoon at these hours as the sun sets. Sentimentali Mutar lo mar la moa cheref Kama machar yamut baeref Kama machar ishkab lanuach Bibli sachar keger sharuach Uma shekan ratach bekezef Nihya katan al saf haetzef יום ידעך ועיר מנגד ואיש קטן ילך בשקט או לה 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 מה יש לי עוד? מה עוד היה לי? מותר להיות סנטימנטלי מה יש לי עוד? מה עוד היה לי? מותר להיות סנטימנטלי. מה יש לי עוד? מה עוד היה לי? מותר להיות סנטימנטלי. מה יש לי עוד? מה עוד היה לי? מותר להיות סנטימנטלי. Thank you. song I recorded in, um, in one of the most unusual, unique concerts that I get to do since the day I recorded it, since 1993, at the Sunrise in Masada, which is a, such an incredible concert. I invite you all to uh, attend one of those. Um, I do it every summer. It starts at three in the morning, and we watch the sun rises over the desert, over the Dead Sea. And this song became part, inseparable part of this um, concert. It's a love song, it's called Under the Sky, Mitachat HaShamayim. It goes like this. Banu lecha, mitachat HaShamayim, Shnayim, kmo zorinayim. Yesh lanu zman, 
מתחת לשמיים, בינתיים אנו עוד כאן, את ואני, את ואני, את ואני, והמיטה רחבה לתת אהבה, לילה ויום, לילה ויום, לילה ויום. והחיוך מתנצל, שהוא מתנצל. כן, באנו לכאן, מתחת השמיים, שניים כמו זוג עיניים. יש לנו זמן, מתחת השמיים, בינתיים, אנו עוד כאן. שנינו היכן, שנינו היכן, שנינו היכן, אחד שלם ועגול, שלם וגדול, בואי ניתן, בואי ניתן, בואי ניתן, אני אתן לך לתת, לתת לי לתת לך. כן, באנו לכאן, מתחת השמיים. שניים כמו זוג עיניים יש לנו זמן מתחת השמיים בינתיים אמרנו עוד כאן ולמרות הפער ולמרות הכאב ולמרות הצער אני ואוהב, 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 Na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na One more time, come on, just try this, come on Hey, na-na-na-na Everybody That's right Na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na Yesh lanu zman, yeh, yeh Yesh lanu zman Mitachat ha-shamayi Benatai Amanu Kao Banu lecha כן שניים כמו 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 זוג עיניים יש יש לנו זמן תחת השמיים ובינתיים יש לנו זמן הרבה הרבה זמן הרבה זמן Thank you, that was beautiful singing, thanks so much. It's kind of hard to say everything one, everything one wants to say on a panel. Imagine having to sing everything I want to sing in that time. But um, I do have time for this one more song, which is a, a most uh, meaningful and significant song for me. It's the first song I ever wrote. And... Uh, This is in November of 1977, which is 38 years ago. And uh, I'd never written a song before, and on the very eve when Egypt's president, Anwar Sadat, set foot in Israeli soil for the first time, and I was watching this on television with a good close friend, who was a new friend then, Israeli poet, Jonathan Geffen. And uh, yes, and Jonathan, who's a brilliant, writer and unique performer great poet and he was feverishly writing this poem or something on a paper as we were watching the news unfold and then he handed it to me and 
kind of insisted that I write music to it. And he gave me two days. He said, we're going to perform it in two days. I was a little perplexed, but uh, I sat down on my couch for two days. And I came out with this song. It's called Things Will Be Better. Yetov goes like this. אני מביט מהחלון, וזה עושה לי די עצוב. האביב חלף עבר לו, מי יודע אם ישוב. הליצן היה למלך, הנביא נהיה ליצן, ושכחתי את הדרך, אבל אני עוד כאן, ויהיה טוב. יהיה טוב, כן, לפעמים אני נשבע. אז הלילה, או הלילה, איתך אני נשאר. ילדים לובשים כנפיים ועפים אל הצבא. ואחרי שנתיים הם חוזרים ללא תשובה. אנשים חיים במתח, מחפשים סיבה לנשום. ובין שנאה לרצח, מדברים על השלום. ויהיה טוב, יהיה טוב, כן. לפעמים אני נשבע. אז הלילה, או הלילה, איתך אני נשאר. כן, שם למעלה, בשמיים, עננים לומדים לעוף, ואני מביט למעלה, ורואה מטוס חטוף, ממשלה של גנרלים. מחלקת את הנוף לשלהם ולשלנו ולא רואים את הסוף. או הנה בא נשיא מצרים, איך שמחתי לקראתו, פירמידות בעיניים ושלום במקטרתו. ואמרנו, היי, hey, בוא נשלים מה, ונחיה כמו אחים. ואז הוא אמר קדימה, רק תצאו מהשטחים. ויהיה טוב, או יהיה טוב, כן. לפעמים אני נשבע. אז הלילה, או איתך אני נשאר. I just want to make a point here. This has been 38 years and over the years, whenever there was a hopeful moment in the peace process, which gave birth to this song, and I would get a phone call from my friend Yonatan Geffen, and he'd tell me that he... He's so moved and hopeful that he's written a new verse and and then he would dictate it to me and I would add it on sing it for a few weeks and then see that things are not moving in quite a fast enough pace so I would let go and go back to the original version of the song and however over these years we've we've added something like um I don't know, about 27 new verses so and I know I don't have the time for all of them it would be sunrise by the time we're done but um <laughs> I would like to conclude this song with one verse that perhaps says it all for me, perhaps for all of us in this room. This one says that we shall learn to live together under the olive trees. And that children will grow up knowing no more wars, no terror, and no frontiers. And that fresh new grass will grow over the graveyards for love and peace. For after a hundred years of war, we haven't and will not lose hope. Od nilmad lichyot biyachad 
הם חורשות עצי זיתים. ילדים יחיו בלי פחד, בלי גבולות, בלי מקלטים. על קברים יפרח העשב לשלום ואהבה מאה שנים של חרב ועוד לא, לא אבדה התקווה ויהיה טוב, יהיה טוב, כן לפעמים אני נשבע אז הלילה, או הלילה איתך אני נשאר ויהיה טוב, כן, יהיה טוב, כן, לפעמים אני נשבע. אז הלילה, או הלילה, איתך אני נשאר. אני מביט מהחלון, אולי מגיע. כן, מגיע, כן, מגיע יום חדש, כן, 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 יהיה טוב! תודה רבה, תודה רבה, תודה רבה, דויד ברוזה The Jerusalem Post would like to recognize and honor the Outstanding Israeli Inclusion Initiative Special in Uniform Special in Uniform is a unique program now operating in partnership with Jewish National Fund, JNF, to integrate young people with autism and other disabilities into the Israel Defense Forces, and in turn, into Israel society. Its core belief is that everyone belongs and has the right to reach his or her full potential.